Good morning, English majors. For today's topic is about ways to address grammar in the writing classroom. This presentation aims to suggest ways in which composition instructors or you as English teachers can incorporate grammar instruction into their writing lesson plans. This report will present arguments to help students understand why grammar is relevant and important to study. And it also suggests several methods for incorporating grammar lessons into the writing classroom. Students and Grammar Students' relationship with grammar is often an antagonistic one. For most students groan when their teachers mention grammar. So students assume or believe that grammar isn't as important as expression. Of course, it is wrong. Interesting ideas are vital to writing. But if there are grammatical errors, expression is often hampered and the reader can be distracted from those ideas. Next, if they are bad at grammar, then they are bad writers, which is par partially correct, but you have to encourage students to see grammar as only one aspect of their writing. Most writers struggle with something like sentence structure, commas, or the use of punctuations, even spelling, but writing can always be polished and corrected before it's handed or published. That's the beauty of proofreading and revision. Writing is only a matter of grammar, which is obviously false. Grammar is only the mechanics of language. Much more goes into good writing than correct grammar. Yes, grammar is only a mechanics of language. However, grammar mistakes can distract the reader from their ideas or expression. You might give your students some of the following reasons for focusing on grammar at times. First, if the writer or your student has obviously neglected to proofread his or her writing, the reader will encounter several problems. For example, the readers may not be able to focus on ideas or those ideas may actually be unclear due to grammatical errors. And overall, grammar affects a writer's ethos. Number one, did the writer seem educated? And another thing, if the students or the writer neglected to proofread his or her writing, it affects their ethos. For example, it is unquestionable to the reader if the writer seem educated. The reader may assume that the writer is either uneducated and therefore not worth reading. Did he or she appear to take the work seriously? Or that the writer did not care enough about what he or she was saying to really polish it for an audience? A large part of a writer's ethos comes simply from his or her willingness to polish his or her words and ideas. It looks like the writer did not care about what she or he was saying, then why should the reader? Next, tools like spell check aren't always accurate. Many students believe that they don't need to address grammar since tools like spell check in Microsoft Word or WPS will do it for them. However, be sure to impress upon them that such tools aren't always accurate and in some cases may suggest they correct something that isn't necessarily wrong. Remind them that they are smarter than such technology and that these tools were designed to assist them, not the one to do the thinking for them. Finally, remind your students that their audiences will always hold them accountable as the writer for accuracy. Next is the four methods of incorporating effective grammar instruction into the writing classroom. Depending on your own strengths as an instructor, one of these methods may appeal to you more than others, or you may wish to use several of these methods in conjunction with one another in order to create some variation for yourself and your students in class. So these are the methods. Number one, weekly mini lessons. Two, student grammar presentations. Three, conference tutorials. And number four, independent study guide and test. 
So first, let us discuss the first method, the weekly mini lessons, especially if your strength is lecturing. So the situation might be, you can ask your students to make an essay, then choose a common error you've noticed in students' paper that week. Illustrate the error in context. For example, you have noticed that your students are confused in using the tenses. Then bring photocopies of a paper excerpt. Let the students realize what should be corrected. Work on an overhead copy. Offer methods of recognizing the error. Have students work in pairs on a sample text. Let them do the work. So what to keep in mind with this approach? Inform students early on that their papers will be used as sample text. Don't identify the writers of sample papers. Nobody wants to be the bad example. Give students a chance to identify or fix the error before you give it away. And let the students do the work. Do not use this method to embarrass your student to the whole class. As I said, let them recognize their own error or they can exchange their paper to their seatmate. Next method is student grammar presentation. Students can still learn grammar even with their groups. So the situation might be, have students pair up and draw grammar topic from a hat or any materials that they can use. On their scheduled day, each pair will give a 10-minute presentation and create an accompanying handout for the class. Also, encourage students to make presentation fun. For example, quiz shows with prizes, role-playing, etc. So what to keep in mind with this approach? Point students to use resources like the OWL or a writing handbook. Sources that is reliable. Make sure students understand the grammatical jargon they encounter or use. Will their audience understand it? They should not use languages that is unfamiliar to the audiences. Meet with pairs during conferences or help the students if some part of the topic is vague and let them preview their presentations. With this approach, it's important to stress that you, the instructor, are not the primary audience for the grammar presentation. They need to write the presentation to teach their peers. Another method is conference or tutorials if you need to use conference time. So the situation might be address grammar one-on-one -on -one in context. This is for a teacher and a student using the student's recent writing. Focus on one pattern of error at a time. Have the students identify and correct the errors in his or her own paper. Model, revision, techniques, or alternatives. You can call them one-on-one -on -one and tell them what is needed to be done or what paragraph needed to revise. If you meet with your students for individual conferences, this would be a great time to talk with each other student and his or her specific grammatical errors and or concerns. Working individually with students gives them personalized attention on their writing and also give them a safe, safe context in which to ask questions. So what to keep in mind with this approach? Don't overwhelm the students. Focus on only one or two errors per conference. Give students a mini assignment or goal for next time. For example, eliminate comma splices in your next paper or be able to summarize the rules for semicolon use. It's important to have the students set a goal or give the students a task for the next time so that when they learn in the conference, carries through to the writing. You might have them focus on eliminating a particular error in their next essay or have them to be able to summarize the rules for a particular concept the next time you meet. And the last method is independent study guide if you're a proponent of individual study. So the situation might be simply hand out a packet of grammar study materials at the beginning of the semester. Use a sample text each week to illustrate a grammar rule from the packet. 
hold a class review session, schedule a test or quizzes over the materials. This method encourages the student to study and memorize concepts on their own. This method can easily be combined with any of the previous three methods so that students study on their own but also have opportunities during class to see errors in context and or discuss grammar as a class. Encourage students to study together. And what to keep in mind with this approach? Give students opportunities to see the grammar rules and concepts in context. Review rules and concepts in conferences. Have students work on sample text in class. So just make sure that you refer to the concepts including in your packet in class and conferences to give students opportunities to see these concepts in the context of real writing and to get used to using the grammatical terms in conversation about writing. So that's it. I hope you understand well the methods to address grammar in the writing classroom. Thank you and God bless. Hello everyone, hello ma'am, and hello classmates. I am Lama J. Shal An, your reporter. I'm here to discuss one of the subtopic of assessing grammar effectively. So, by assessing grammar effectively as a teacher, we have a ways that we need to follow. And also, we have an, some a lot of assessment that can help us to assess the skills of our student. So, let's find out. I will present to you my PowerPoint presentation. <clears throat> okay, so one of the subtopic of assessing grammar effectively is the way to assess the grammar skills, grammar skills of our students and also us as a teacher. So let's find out. Based on our research, we have 10 ways to assess the grammar skills of the student. So how those 10 can help us and give us a tips to assess the grammar. So I am here, the reporters, to present it to you. Let's find out. Okay, the first one is oral interview. The oral interview have two categories. The first one is it can be the class type and also discussion and also it can be the private discussion. In terms of private, um, it's called one-on-one -on -one interview of your student. And also, it can be have a, a schedule, and also it can be the seatmate of the student. They can also um oral interview each other. So in terms of oral, it can interview. It helps in terms of listening, listening of the student. Um, we are the one who need to observe it and also to evaluate it and in terms of speaking ability of our student if how they pronounce if how vocabularies that they have are good if their grammar structures are are fine are upgrading okay so that's the way how oral interview can help The second one is the class presentation. So when we say class presentation, it um, types, it looks like a reporting style. Okay, so in terms of class presentation, we discuss their um, spoken language, which is the students have, they have a different 
different um, way to communicate. And also, we can also um, observe there the speaking skills of the students and how they um, become creative and how they become um, critical thinking fast in certain topic that we will give them on the spot. And also, it can help them to speak in the front if it's um, needed. The third one is the role play. So, how can role play help us to assess the grammar skills of our students in terms of a speaking ability that given of teachers in to the student and also how the student become creative to the character that um, she or he has. Okay, and also um, in terms of gestures, in terms of pronunciation of the student in the front of the class. And also um, role play can give them creativity creativity on how how they and how they um, make the role play easy and how the role play become funny or even the um, flow of the play how they can did it by a teamwork of course okay the fourth is the closed exam. So closed is the exam is just like a fill in the black. But this test is typically to understand the student grammar. Okay, and it is um originally read right to the paragraph um form. And also let the student, if they have study on that certain test. Of course, they are um, think logically and grammatically in terms of putting the correct words for the certain um, paragraph that you are given as a teacher's. And here we go, the fill in the blank. So how fill in the blank um, help us? Well, like what I said earlier, um, it is a similar to a closed exam. But then in terms of fill in the blank, this type of test is specifically in the grammatical structure and also the set of the vocabularies that given given on the test so um it's the same then like they have it a paragraph and their paragraph or sentence for the student and let the student think what is the provided words for the certain blank okay and we have here writing samples. So how the writing samples can help to assess the grammar skills of the students. So we know that writing samples is very um, personal for every one of us. Why? Because in the writing samples, it is include your opinion. It is include what's of the back of your mind have it is include the grammar structure that how you can um how you can write the words that you have and also it is a good way to assess as a professional teacher the grammar proficiency of the student if how the structure are good or bad or getting chaos <laughs> getting chaos most of the time and it's also typically um homework and also um on the spot in terms of on the spot it's very um 
it's very um, perfect for us to analyze what are the what are the words that come up to the mind of the student when they hear example some topics if they given some um some words what are the other words can they relate on that specific one okay and here we have here also the pronunciation the punctuation of the student in terms of writing um skills so that is how the writing skills can help and also we have it the portfolio so portfolio even the grade one even the elementary have it so in terms of portfolio it is include um, assigned to everyone very personal for our student it include um words and it include um all the activities of the student, the written, also the creativity in terms of the other presentation, like um, mga art work that we are given. So it's very um, help. It also can give us um, the tips because it is the same thing that how they are become effective in terms of the reading in terms of writing and listening uh, speaking and also the grammar and that's down to online quiz so here's online quiz is very um popular because nowadays because of the pandemic and the platform education that we have it is a very um it is that is the one that we use nowadays so in terms of online quiz it is um conduct um some research but then it is a paraphrase or as a student you need you just have a um information background but all in all it's it is your um, ability to create or to make a structure of um, sentence paragraph that you want to answer in the certain questions. Okay, so this is um, can help to assist the student um, if the student still remember some topics that um, you have discussed or maybe um, stock knowledge or also it can be um, knowledgeable for the whole week for the whole sem for the whole quarter that you are done to discuss and also it can um, spend time to their home and also um, to their places where they are comfortable to work and also to answer the exercise or the quizzes available um, online. Well, of course, as a teacher, you should um, evaluate it. Okay, so second to the last, we have the multiple choice exam. So multiple choice exam is very popular before <laughs> but we have no pandemic but then yeah so how is a multiple choice um can help us so it is um given us as something classic the way to assess our student and also um let the student point what are the answer that they have back of their mind of course um in terms of grammar if what are the um, past tense what are the um, present tense or tense like uh, for those words so something like that that in terms of multiple choice grammar in terms of grammar subject to see how they are grammat grammatically um, correct and if they remember the verb the non-verb and the adjectives something like that and the last but not the least is very popular 
the true and false quiz. So how it can help and also the true and false quiz is also classic and popular now um nowadays and even before because you can have it through um online platforms. Okay, so um to all of us is very um important and to see how the student correct the questions and if they are answer the false so let them um critical thinking if it is correct or not something like that if um they have it um if they have still knowledgeable in the past topic that you have discussed and also um the false um answer and also it can easy to and to identify their mistakes but then as a professor professor it is better to if they have got a mistake you must give the correct one the correct answer so that they um review it or they have um observe that where are the, the questions that they got um, wrong so those 10 that i've done to discuss and can help us to assess the grammar skills of our students well hoping that all of them are you still remember so the addition of my report let's discuss um, importance of grammar so how the grammar very important and why the grammar is one of the part of the subject in our curriculum nowadays so because the grammar is provide information from the reader's comprehension yes it is correct um, you will every moment that we have um, that we search that we read that we observe the grammar why because when the um, grammar structures is like a chaos it's hard for our reader to understand the statement it's hard for the um, reader to this uh, to analyze what are the sentence all about what are the um they want to um present as a reader so and also um it is a structure that conveys precise meaning from the writers to the audience yes it is it is also um can give and also um, eliminate grammatically errors from your writings and reward the readers with clear communication. Of course, when the, um, one of the importance of a grammar is as a messenger that, as a messenger that give the statement to the other people, to the readers, it's, be it's better that it is um, clear and also it is um, can help to a reader to um, analyze the the, gra the statement it can gives them um, help at the same time because if it's getting chaos everything chaos in the world will not important okay well in terms of importance of grammar they have a lot but then it is some additional information so that i add just a few of them okay so here naman why the grammar assessment is important so those 10 that i've given already 
what are the reasons or why they are important well it is very um those 10 we observe that those are useful in our um curriculum it's also indicated and also it can um have the student and as well as a teacher um connection so um grammar assessment is important in terms of punctuation and spelling concept also it helped them to assess the basic um, fundamentals principles of an english grammar okay the second one is the test is basically um use the abbreviation of how those students use it and also the common words the vocabularies that they have if they are um vocabularies that they have is deeply and or maybe just a basic um easy to understand okay and also what the part of a speech can use it every day of their life so and the third one is um why grammar assessment is important because it is um help in english in terms of marketing sales technical or customer support and if they are um help other people it can be yes okay so we have here um three elements of grammatical knowledge so the first one is grammatical forms or the structure of a language of course grammar is um, connected to the language because it is the structures and then the third is grammar meaning of those forms and then the that is the second and then the third is pragmatic meaning are used in a given context okay so of course ha having a second language it is very important for us to study all about the grammar <clears throat> Okay, I'll be back at again. Sorry for technical issue again. Um, as a teacher, it is um very useful to study all about the grammar because we have a second language, which is the English. The English is um very uh, popular and also it is um very helpful to us when we go to the other country to become equipped and competitive individuals also grammar can help us and evaluate us to communicate in listening speaking reading writing and also how our mind can analyze or give creativity in terms of visual okay communicative competence okay discuss it that they have a four components the grammatical social linguistic discourse and strategic component so those four or three slide is just additional to my topic um, for each every one of us to know how the grammar how the grammar um, important and also what is grammar and also um why the reason that as a teacher we must assess our student grammar skills again again it's me Ms. Tamar J. Shalan, thank you for your listening and thank you for 
understanding. Have a blessed day. Blessed day, everyone. My name is Rosa Salome Arapiliano, and our topic for today is all about methods of marking grammatical errors in grammar resources. Methods of marking grammatical errors. But first, how does marking grammatical errors benefit students? They confirm the correction of grammatical errors helps students in language learning. Also, Lester 2004 and Long 2007 support the findings of the study that students make a grammatical error due to poor knowledge of grammatical rules and that the teacher plays a key role in correcting grammatical errors. And now, I will going to show you some of the methods that I've searched. Full Error Checklist This checklist outlines the questions we need to ask about each part of speech or common category of word. Verbs Is the verb in the correct form and tense? Does it agree with the subject? Second is pronouns. Does the pronoun agree with the noun he is replacing? Is it in the correct case? Number three, gerunds. Is the gerund replacing a main verb and creating a sentence fragment? Is it part of a list that is in parallel? Has it been incorrectly switched with an infinitive? Number four, prepositions. Is the preposition idiomatically correct? Does it incorrectly complete a word pair? Number five, adjectives and adverbs. Is the modifier of the correct type? Are er and est used appropriately? Number six, conjunctions. Is the conjunction creating a sentence fragment? Does it logically connect ideas? Number seven, is the noun part of a quality comparison? Is the sentence consistent in its use of plural and singular nouns? Number eight, relative pronouns who, which, that, etc. Is the correct pronoun used for the context? Does the pronoun have a clear noun and a precedent? Marking grammar errors in student writing. What, when, where, why, and how by Jordan Ryle. Here are five error marking tips that you can use right away in that stack of papers waiting in your office. Number one, assess your priorities as an instructor and those of your discipline. What is the most important writing issue that you think these students need to work on? Number two, only marking errors that you feel are serious, meaning that they obscure meaning or that they would negatively affect a student's character in the eyes of someone reading the paper. Number three, try to send the message that higher order concerns such as critical engagement, development of ideas, an organization should be attended first and are valued more highly. Number four, whatever marketing strategy you use, encourage students to develop self-editing and proofreading skills. And lastly, think of minor errors as making a career in accent. Realizing that all multilingual students are in the process of acquiring a second language. The ability to write nearly error-free prose is a long-term goal that students should aim for, but it is unrealistic to expect this to happen quickly. A 
and for certain idiosyncratic rules in English, such as article usage and idioms, students may always need to solicit feedback from others before submitting a final piece of writing. A continuum of instructor involvement in marking student errors. 1. Pixel errors for the student become essentially a line editor. This strategy doesn't help the student, and it creates an unrealistic amount of work for the instructor. Number 2. Mark, but don't correct all errors asking students to revise. This approach is attractive because the responsibility for fixing the error falls to the student, who is challenged to understand then correct the errors they made. It is the time consuming for the instructor, however, and doesn't provide an opportunity for students to develop their own proofreading skills since they aren't required to find their own errors. Number 3. Line edit some errors, then ask students to fix the rest. This might take the form of the instructor editing one parable but leaving one parable unmarked. Giving students an edited parable can be useful in helping students see what their errors are and possible corrections. However, marking and fixing errors requires a significant amount of time, attention, and experience. Also, some argue that fixing any errors for students discourages them from working to fix errors on their own and encourages a passage of those to proofreading. It can also send the message that the most important part of revision is correcting grammar errors rather than rewriting or development of ideas or the argument organization or other content-related elements. Next, identify but don't correct some errors, asking students to revise and or find errors, similar errors in the unmarked section of the paper. An advantage to this method is that it gives students feedback on the errors they are making, while also encouraging active proofreading on their part. By alerting students to the type of error they are making, instructors are giving feedback that contributes to the development of effective proofreading. To encourage students to proofread their paper, assuming the instructor is marking a final draft, the student might be required to edit the final draft further before receiving a final grade. Next, Use minimal marking to let students know there are errors but don't locate or identify errors for them. This method encourages students to find and fix their own errors. The goal is to help students develop the habit of proofreading their own writing. It also avoids sending the message that the goal of revision is solely to fix grammar errors. With minimal marking, students should be encouraged to find and fix the errors. One strategy is for the instructor to raise the grade when the edited paper is returned or for the instructor to hold off on grading until the draft has been edited. Next, don't mark any errors but give the student the feedback that the paper is marked with errors and will lose points. Advantages A big time saver for the instructor, more responsibility for the instructor to help the student develop editing skills. But the disadvantages students may feel criticized and unsupported, leading to feelings of depression and isolation. Students are not encouraged to develop healthy academic skills, and we must avoid it. Marking and editing strategies. Here are 
are three approaches to one errors. Remember that all of these approaches are more effective when paired with a strategy for holding the students accountable for making the correction so that they develop their own editing skills. First, color coding and highlighting. Similar to error codes, color coding and highlighting uses a previously explained system for marking errors. This saves time when marking papers. Students often find it much easier to understand a document with different colored highlights than a document with scribble. Difficult to read shorthand markings. So, here are the examples. Number two, correction symbols. This represents a relatively short piece of correction system. Adapting a similar key and sharing it with your students at the beginning of the term can help streamline marking and discuss writing thought of the semester. This can be useful because it helps develop a common language for describing and identifying errors. Holding and more detailed charts can be developed depending on the rules, time, limitations, and level of content working with students in these errors. Often, though, especially in a class not dedicated to editing practice, restricting your marking to a limited number of errors will be more effective. Here are the examples. Minimal marking. There are various forms of minimal marking, ranging from highlighting or underlining errors without making comments or writing questions, marks or check marks in the margins to alert students to errors. An important aspect of this approach is to make all the grade until the revisions are made or offer to raise the grade once the revisions are made. So, here are the examples. Let's move on to grammar resources. Grammars, a real word for a big concept. Grammar learning comes with a lot. Part of speech, sentence structure, vocabulary, punctuation, the list goes on. Powerful you have in common. Hira's phrase away of speaking showcases the power of grammar. Grammar may be a dumb word, but learning grammar empowers kids' imagination with a creative building blocks of writing. Grammar is to language what a tool backs is to make it an invention. Learn how to use the tools, and the possibilities are limitless. Grammar is the study of how to form a words, or phrases, glosses, or sentences. Beginning skills involve learning parts of speech, like nouns and verbs. More advanced grammar learning includes how to form irregular verbs and how to write complex clauses. So here are the examples of grammar resources. Seven great grammar sites for teachers and students. One, grammar bites. Grammar Bytes is a great website that is packed full of the teach materials teacher can use to teach grammar. Grammar Bytes provides a glossary of common terms, fun interactive activities, and exercises for students to test their grammar knowledge. Instructional presentations and rules of tips on teaching grammar. Number 2. Road to Grammar Road to Grammar is a free website that provides a wide variety of resources for teaching grammar. These resources include lessons, quizzes, and games. It also features a section called Downloads, where you can download the materials to use in your class. Number 3. Grammar Code Grammar Code provides 
Ronald Fox's footage will be applied. You can click on any of the grades to access the grammar lessons and its features. Each of these lessons includes a piece that students can take to test their grammar knowledge related to that lesson. Number 4. Grammar Snack. Grammar Snack provides short features to explain how grammar is being used in real life situation. It also provides conversation style explanations and interactive exercises to check students' comprehension of the language. Number 5. Fun Brain Grammar Gorillas. Grammar Gorillas is a website that provides fun interactive grammar exercises to students to help them improve their grammar skills. The site is mostly relevant for primary and secondary students. Number 6. Grammarly Handbook. Grammarly Handbook features a variety of grammar lessons covering different topics such as adjectives, nouns, positions, verbs, interjections, punctuations, writing mechanics, and sentence style and sentence clarity. The lessons are explained in a clear and easy to grasp language, illustrated with several examples. Number 7. Brain Pub Grammar. Brain Pub is another wonderful website that offers grammar lessons and activities that help students polish their grammar skills. The content is neatly organized into separate categories with an easy navigation layout. Welcome to University Library Skills in Grammar for Academic Practical Source. Here are some grammar resources that I search. The resource covers structure, the population, common spelling, or word choice issues, using academic languages, and here is the other resources. There is a lot of resources that you can find in the internet, but you must remember that you will choose the reliable resources so that your students can really acquire the knowledge that they need. Related books and ebooks available from our libraries. These are just a selection. Please see the library catalog for more. So, here are some of the resources that I have searched. Here's the references. And that's my topic all about the methods of marking grammatical errors and grammar resources. As a future indicator, we must prepare ourselves for our future students. We all know that teaching grammar is not yet easy, so we need to study and learn more because the more we learn new things, the more we can help other people. And we need to find the reliable resources so we can teach confidently to them the grammar without hesitation. We can do these future indicators and always remember never stop learning because life never stops teaching. Thank you for listening. Good morning, students. I am Janus Angelus Mosley, and I am going to teach about the three grammatical frameworks by Larson Freeman. First slide. Teaching grammar. We, as an aspiring, as an aspiring future educator, we often we really teach grammar for them to understand a deeper meaning in every words in every conversations that conveys in us especially for us when we read when we hear words sentences and so first in general terms in teaching the three grammatical frameworks in grammar there are general terms 
and I have entailed two general terms. First is that few learners are capable to adapt from composed teaching. Composed teaching is one of the hard and it. Why? Because composed te teaching is a uh, one way, one flow, good flow of teaching. And there are some students, especially for us, when we take our LPT, when we teach, especially in English as our second language, it is hard for them. When we have our own LPT license, we, we often teach to public schools and to serve and to lead the generation, the next generation. So for us, we always, we need to expect that only few of them will understand our teaching, especially in grammar. Because not everyone, not every student is interested and every student is not good enough in English subject. Is our high school days. We often use EOP or English only policy environment when English subject. I know what it feels like. I know how hard to speak in English when I'm in grade 8 in high school and it gives me chills, it gives me shame I'm and especially I'm embar embarrassed because English is for universal language and it gives a big it gives um high in standard for you to master it to understand the every meaning to understand every words especially so next a three dimensional grammar framework first is the form or the structure of the grammar second is the meaning or the semantics of the grammar next is use or the pragmatics of the grammar now now form according to spada and light brown 1993 and 1998 form is important to be considered within communicative interactions and meaningful context it's self-explanatory actually because form is important in communication in meaningful context that we need to understand because through form we will see the message they need to convey the words that we will understand we often need to understand through form we will see the message as a deeper meaning Mes the message has a double meaning now let us proceed to the first form of the three dimensional patterns form morphosynthetic syntactic and lexical patterns first let us describe morphology morphology it is study of the forms of things or study of the forms of words so when conducting a grammar when you will make a sentence you need you need to follow you need to look for this for the forms of it phonemic and graphemic graphemic patterns phonemic patterns also describes about the the tone of how you will pronounce it the the way that you will deliver is a different pronunciation will also will lead to different explanation and different in meaning so we need when delivering a report or message we must know how to properly put the the comma 
the period apostrophe apostrophe and so on so lexical patterns from the morphosyntactic I would like to add about the morphosyntactic and lexical patterns lexical means that we need to look and to know the vocabulary for every grammar for every sentences that we are conducting because using of different words using a deeper words may give a good form or result to a good to a good explanation because they will learn a new world a new word and they will understand that English is something interesting how is it formed form is formed through the usage of the words that we need to follow how is it formed form is formed by these two examples formed in grammatical in the framework of grammatical it consists of in how a word change form to reflect things like tense plurality gender and etc i have two examples of form first is the inflecting nouns inflecting nouns is how you will change a word by adding s or es and ies the example is in the picture next is the allomorph allomorph is a morpheme are derived from phonological rules and any morphophonemic rules that may apply to that morpheme example of allomorphs hat is with s is pronounced hat and in phonetic form it is he yets so it's hats dogs boxes that's the example of form now then the two the part the second part of three-dimensional framework is the meaning lexical meaning the the lexical meaning is also known as the dictionary definition it shows the closely matching the meaning of the term in a common usage it it refers to how a, a word really defines really means in just a one word in a sentence the subject in the sentence it is shows the main function in the meaning of it that we that you deliver that you convey to another person or to an essay next is the grammatical meaning grammatical meaning is the meaning conveyed in a sentence by word order and other grammatical signals it also called the structural meaning because the structure itself the meaning itself has its own production of words that you will understand what does it mean here are the examples possession description amount relationship part whole origin agent it's self-explanatory thank you the third framework is the use use means the social context social context is shown that social context can influence how someone perceives something it shows that the use of words will give influence to the one who reads it 
to the one who want to understand the message you have given it also shows the linguistic discourse it discourse refers to a unit of a language longer than a single sentence the use of grammar shows that in a sentence if you were going to identify or to acquire the meaning excuse me the meaning of it you will have more and more sentences due to its meaning from the usage of every words of every part clause for the subjects in a sentence will show more variety meanings next is the influence of pragmatics influence of pragmatics is the ability to understand another speaker's intended meaning is called pragmatic it shows competence due that how does the context contributes to the meaning how it becomes more useful how it gives many ideas for example the spider grab i know that you are all known in spider grab in just a one word you can create a meaning of it using this spider graph so that's the three dimensional framework that i'm going to teach that i have teach to all of you thank you everyone i hope you learned something even if it's a review for some of the topics previously discussed thank you hi good morning classmates and good morning professor my name is joseph and i'm here to discuss one of the topics in grammar assessment which is innovations in grammar assessment so let's start with a good question why do we need to study innovations in grammar assessment well your guess is as good as mine the english language is changing just like any other human language in the world language is always changing evolving and adapting to the needs of its users so is this a bad thing especially for our soon to be english language teachers are what we are studying now becoming obsolete when we graduate well definitely it's not a bad thing is if language hasn't changed say since 1950 we wouldn't have any words or terms for modems uh, cable tv fax machines or even the internet so we must welcome these um, news that the language is changing scientists also have discovered that language grammatical structures change more quickly than vocabulary, overturning a long-held assumption in this particular field. So as teachers, it will be one of our responsibilities to make sure that the rules, the current rules are applied or are followed, but we also should leave room for a possibility that in a decade or even a year or so, the structure and these rules can change. Hence, this module is here to let us all know that there is some kind of innovations happening around us. What we will be discussing today related to the innovations in grammar assessment are redefining the construct, partial scoring, social dimension, and the standard. Okay, so let's watch this video from one of the trending videos on the internet. A short disclaimer, there is no pun intended for showing this video. This is solely for educational purposes. Do you want to say my baby? Sure. Oh. <laughs> uh, yes. yes. Uh, my baby. What are you going? What are you going? Hello, good morning. Good morning. 
What are you doing? Are you okay? Oh, I was just watching TV. Watching TV? Yeah, watching the news. Uh -oh. Me, I'm here and catering to my mother because my mother is mild stroke. <laughs> she had a stroke? Uh oh. Mild stroke. Oh. Mm. Amunas is. Oh. An kuan? Tunyani na. Inalagan ito nanay. Catering to your mother? Kirgi. Kirgi. Oh, I'm not going to get a Yes, I'm here. Yes. Where are you from? I'm from uh, Indiana, USA. Uh, USA? You are from Philippines? Yes, I'm yes, Philippines. USA. I'm Philippines. Okay. The USA. USA. Give me load Giga 50 yeah, from USA. USA. I send you my number. Your number? Uh uh. Giga 50. Or how about Gosser 50? Do you speak in Italiano? No. You, Do you speak in mathematics uh, language? But... You are not speaking speak in Italian? Do you speak no. in mathematics? No. Why? The mathematics language is very, very good. Well, honey, in our country, we speak one of, we speak English. Number what? one, and some people. There's Okay. Because I'm catering to my mother. My mother is mild stroke. Huh, baby? Bye. Love you. So, after watching that video, how did you feel? Are you one of those who were actually laughing at that uh, poor English usage of that girl on the video? Or are you someone who cringed a lot while watching it? Is you've noticed a lot of grammatical um, errors that you wanted to correct okay so that video is related to what we will be discussing today because as we might be well aware of there are a lot of uh, changes that happen in the grammar structures now we also need to make sure that our assessments are adaptive to these kind of changes too Okay, let's start with redefining the construct. So going through um, redefining the construct, it's, it's about going beyond the assessment of grammatical form. So we're not just after the form or the structure, but it should include the meaning and the usage of grammar itself. So looking at that video, going back to the video that we've shown you guys, um, could you agree that even if um, the girl's grammar was so poor, she can still be understood? Yeah? This also happened a lot, um, especially when, uh, just to give you an example, when Manny Pacquiao was also very new in the international boxing arena. When he's having his interviews, people especially are judgmental, uh, Filipino people cringed when they're hearing him speak because of the poor English usage structures. But this kind of innovation or redefining a construct thing, it's talking about uh, more on the, the usage of grammar itself, the meaning uh, of what you're trying to say versus us looking at the form or the structure. So speakers... Um, have a choice of whatever grammatical resources they want to deploy. And just like what Larson and Freeman in 2002 mentioned, or Larson Freeman in 2002 mentioned, grammar is not a linguistic straitjacket. So people should stop saying or should avoid stopping someone from speaking 
just because their grammar is very poor, right? Okay, so let's read um, the statements about partial scoring. Dichotomous scoring versus polytomous scoring. Discrete point tests usually rely on dichotomous scoring of grammatical accuracy. Recently, it has been proposed that scoring grammatical polytomously would yield information about learners who have an intermediary knowledge of grammar, rather than being treated as if they have no knowledge at all. While partial scoring is not a complete solution, it is one step in the long hoped for development of an interlanguage sensitive approach to assessment. So, uh, just to give you an idea what this is all about, a week ago, we just had our exams, our, our midterms exams, to most of our professors. And have you guys noticed the structure of their tests, of their examinations? And we might not be aware of it just yet, but some of our professors actually use a mix of dichotomous scoring and polytomous scoring in their tests. One of the examples of a dichotomous scoring or a dichotomous exam is when they're giving us a multiple choice type of exam or an, even an identification um, type of exam where there is a specific answer targeted. Okay, there is one specific answer targeted. So for example, if your professor uh, gave you five item quiz, which are all multiple choice, then you're targeted to, to earn at least five points out of it. What's a polytomous scoring and how is it different? A polytomous scoring is, uh, an example here, is what Professor Kappa has actually given us a week ago on her midterms exams. And if you've noticed, if you can still remember the questions uh, raised on her exam, and I'm showing it to you here now, for example, in, in number 36 to 40, based from your own experience as a pre-service teacher, what is or are the challenges or challenge you might have already faced when teaching grammar? And how did you resolve that or those? So there is no specific answer to this particular uh, question, but we are being rated in how we will actually deliver our answers there. So if uh, the, the student or what, whoever will be answering this question will uh, be able to um, draft his answer very well, providing all the, the related um, answers or statements to uh, what he's trying to say. And the structure is nice, uh, the form was great, then he might get a five points. Okay, or five points from that particular item. But if somehow uh, there are some criteria that he wasn't able to meet, he might just be get, uh, getting four, three, two, or one. Okay, So it's it's something that will let um, the, the, the student still earn points because of what he knows about the particular um, question and not totally removing that um, uh, chance or, or that knowledge, not disregarding that knowledge that he already has. Because if we put it in a multiple choice, he might get zero totally, yeah? So that's the difference between uh, dichotomous scoring and polytomous scoring. Okay, on social dimension, innovators are arguing that um, students must not be assessed only through traditional psychometric um, systems. For example, the normal grammar test or a vocabulary test. But instead, they want us to try and assess the student when he's interacting with someone, which is pretty logical, I believe, since um, humans are actually um, social animals, right? So we learn uh, by mimicking someone. We also learn from observing someone and we also learn from um, working with someone, okay? So I think this is also one of the great innovations that we have out there that students are not just targeted uh, or not, not just assessed through the normal tests, but instead they're actually tested when they're interacting with someone. 
So moving on to the next slide, it's about the standard. In this, uh, in this part, I, I would ask you guys to watch uh, another video. This time around, it's more on informational. So I just wanted to take down some important things um, which are very, very helpful and insightful, especially for us teachers who are also working on some innovations in assessing grammar. Let's watch this video. You're telling a friend an amazing story, and you just get to the best part when suddenly he interrupts. The alien and I, not me and the alien. Most of us would probably be annoyed, but aside from the rude interruption, does your friend have a point? Was your sentence actually grammatically incorrect? And if he still understood it, why does it even matter? From the point of view of linguistics, grammar is a set of patterns for how words are put together to form phrases or clauses, whether spoken or in writing. Different languages have different patterns. In English, the subject normally comes first, followed by the verb and then the object, while in Japanese and many other languages, the order is subject, object, verb. Some scholars have tried to identify patterns common to all languages, but apart from some basic features, like having nouns or verbs, few of these so-called linguistic universals have been found. And while any language needs consistent patterns to function, the study of these patterns opens up an ongoing debate between two positions known as prescriptivism and descriptivism. Grossly simplified, prescriptivists think a given language should follow consistent rules, while descriptivists see variation and adaptation as a natural and necessary part of language. For much of history, the vast majority of language was spoken. But as people became more interconnected and writing gained importance, written language was standardized to allow broader communication and ensure that people in different parts of a realm could understand each other. In many languages, this standard form came to be considered the only proper one, despite being derived from just one of many spoken varieties, usually that of the people in power. Language purists worked to establish and propagate this standard by detailing a set of rules that reflected the established grammar of their times. And rules for written grammar were applied to spoken language as well. Speech patterns that deviated from the written rules were considered corruptions, or signs of low social status, and many people who had grown up speaking in these ways were forced to adopt the standardized form. More recently, however, linguists have understood that speech is a separate phenomenon from writing, with its own regularities and patterns. Most of us learn to speak at such an early age that we don't even remember it. We form our spoken repertoire through unconscious habits, not memorized rules. And because speech also uses mood and intonation for meaning, its structure is often more flexible, adapting to the needs of speakers and listeners. This could mean avoiding complex clauses that are hard to parse in real time, making changes to avoid awkward pronunciation or removing sounds to make speech faster. The linguistic approach that tries to understand and map such differences without dictating correct ones is known as descriptivism. Rather than deciding how language should be used, it describes how people actually use it and tracks the innovations they come up with in the process. But while the debate between prescriptivism and descriptivism continues, the two are not mutually exclusive. At its best, Prescriptivism is useful for informing people about the most common established patterns at a given point in time. This is important not only for formal contexts, but it also makes communication easier between non-native speakers from different backgrounds. Descriptivism, on the other hand, gives us insight into how our minds work and the instinctive ways in which we structure our view of the world. Ultimately, grammar is best thought of as a set of linguistic habits that are constantly being negotiated and reinvented by the entire group of language users. Like language itself, it's a wonderful and complex fabric woven through the contributions of speakers and listeners, writers and readers, prescriptivists and descriptivists from both near and far.
Alright, so thank you guys for watching and I hope you guys get something out from that video. Just to relate it to my next slide about the standard. So it's it's really important because um, some innovators nowadays are saying that some statements who are ungrammatical but unproblematic, meaning um, not really gonna uh, take a lot of um, change to do in the current um, rules or structure, but can still be uh, understood perfectly, might be standardized okay? and exists a variety of the English language. Okay, so it's it's also important as for us teachers to have uh, to keep a lookout on these kind of um, statements or these kinds of, of, uh, of innovations in the future. Okay, so guys, um, that should actually be the ending of my report. So just to recap about the innovations that we are currently having um, in assessing grammar. So we've talked about the redefining the construct, it, the, the, the construct itself, redefining the form and the structure. We've also talked about partial scoring where our teachers now are, are applying, some of our teachers are applying it. We've also talked about social dimension where um, there is actually a trigger or, or a catalyst for uh, a learner to learn something through social interaction. And we also talked about the standard where there's going to be a possibility of another variety of language to be accepted in the future. All right. So, guys, if you have any questions, feel free to message me here on, on Facebook or Messenger or ask Professor Kappa. That's all, guys. And thank you for listening again. My name is Joseph. Have a nice day. Bye. So, hello. I am Ifri Simban and I am here to discuss about redefining construction. So, redefining construction, I would like to start this discussion with a question. One, um, two, three. What exactly is a sentence? So, a sentence is a self-contained unit of meaning. It means that it is a group of words that conveys a statement. And in every sentence, there are two important parts. And these are as the subject and the predicate. So, for example, um, Rika walked. The subject there is Raiko and the predicate is walked. Next slide um, is the complete subject. So a complete subject is the simple subject, the main word or words in the subject along with any of the modifiers that describe the subject. So for example, my friend Sara is a great singer. So therefore, the... The, the complete subject there is Sarah because it answers the questions, who is a great singer? So the next slide is the complete predicate. Predicate contains the verb and all of the words that modify or complete it. It's, it includes not only um, the verb or verb phrase, but also all the words that give more info about it. So for example, um, the rain poured down from the sky. What did the rain do? It poured down from the sky. Therefore, the poured down from the sky is the complete predicate because it gives more info about the subject. Last one is the sentence fragment. So the sentence fragment is a group of words that does not express a complete thought. So without a complete thought, a phrase is considered a sentence fragment even if it contains both subject and a verb. So when a full thought is not expressed, it means that you have a sentence fragment. Examples are in the bother, running across the field, and early this morning. This will be the end of my presentation. Thank you so much for listening. I
Hello everyone, my name is Vernessa Villar and for today, I'll be discussing the partial scoring and assessing grammar effectively. So what do we meant by partial scoring and assessing grammar of students? Partial scoring, also known as partial grading process, with which you can award points to learners for selecting more than one answers. Also, it assigns value to students' output and provides information to where the content or accuracy of the text can be improved. This time, let us know the significance of partial scoring and assessing grammar of students. Let's have a true example. Learning punctuations and grammar is not simple. Being able to use the language correctly takes ongoing learning practice and patience. Therefore, our newest progressive achievement test for punctuation and grammar will help teachers understand how well their students are learning to make sense of language and how it works in context. Let's have now the types of partial scoring. The first is a modification of a traditional answer key for scoring a multiple choice question or partial credit scoring key. The second is an alternative to the rubric, the scoring guide. The partial credit scoring key can alert teachers to major and minor misconceptions. If you notice on the left side, all responses are scored with only two pins, correct and incorrect. On the right side, the same responses are scored with five pins, pins that distinguish amongst different kinds of incorrect responses. So much for that. Thank you so much for listening. Hello guys, my name is Dana and for today's discussion, I will going to discuss two topics. The number one is social dimension and the second one is the standard. So let's get started. Why do we need to study 5D grammar? We need to study a grammar in order for us to communicate, especially to foreign speakers, to be knowledgeable, to understand English, to acquire new skills in terms of speaking and writing. But why is that some students still have difficulties in terms of learning a grammar? What are the hindrances why they can meet the standard of learning a grammar? So, we're all going to discuss that further on. Okay, social dimension in assessing of grammar. The social dimension defined as all obstacles to access progress and completion in higher or next level of education. These are the difficulties of learners that encounter before they can move on to the next level of discussion or a high level of education. So, we all know that some of our teacher was doing their best in order for us to learn especially here in grammar they show a lot of strategies they share some some support in terms of learning the grammar and also they teach us some techniques and especially they show a lot of activities in order for us to apply our learnings in terms of creating essays and grammar. But why is that some students can't even apply rules or can't even speak the language or rather the English language? So in this discussion, we are going to discuss what are the hindrances or issues in teaching a grammar. So here, here are some of the factors that may affect the student learning capabilities in terms of acquiring 
a no uh, in terms of acquiring a knowledge or rules in grammar so the number one is the poor standard of student so there are students that are even lack of knowledge of basic rules and structural patterns which they supposed to have learned at a lower level number two students find grammatical lessons that are so difficult and boring so we all know that some students learn language only because it is required or it is an academic requirement right so the third one is identity so some students think of their um think about their self when they speak second language some are conscious because on how the way they pronounce words especially those Visaya people those Visaya people like me that has or had a hard pronunciation in some words so next one is the trajectory here is the student is not focused and interested to different subjects because basically they hate english or they love another subject that's why they didn't really tend to give their focus or interest in listening the subject the fifth one is the social class so some students are intimidated or scared to stereotypes believe that if they know or they yes if they know how to speak the language some people tend to bully them especially here in our country some people do have stereotypes believe that if you speak um english you are a saucy or you are in a social class level so we should tell our student that these factors should not be the indicators for them to acquiring the language or to learn the language so we will also going to discuss some things to unlock this difficult so the number one is this is very self-explanatory. So the number one is tell the value of learning the language. So you are going to tell them before you are going to discuss or start the discussion. What are the values that they will going to learn in this language? What are what are the possible skills, which is number two, that they may attain? That they may attain. So, if they want to become a broadcaster or a journalist, grammar will going to help them in order for them to create a great essay or article or an article, right? So, if they want to become a speaker and if they have a dream to have to speak in the diverse places they need to acquire learning a second language or an english or an english language rather third is here in order to define if the, the student really know the previous topic that you've discussed, you need to have a pretest and a post-test exam in order to see or document what are the improvements of the student based on assessing them or having an exam. So fourth one is 
have some interactive activities. Here, you need to have some charades, some associations, in order for an activity to not be boring, in order for them to be, to not just learn but also entertain, because, right? So, make the discussion fun and significant. Same as the number four, we need to have some activities in order for the class to become interactive. We need to have some drama activities, role-playing, and role-playing, drama, or even broadcasting. So, basically, that's all. So, those are the social or social dimensions that may student ex experience or may student or those are the hindrances why students aren't able to access the next to the next level of discussion of the grammar so hope you understand that's all thank you it's me again dana so this is my second report which is entitled The Standard. So what is standard? Standard is something established by authority, customs, or general consent as model or example. So wow, even we, right? We do have our own standard in terms of finding friends, in terms of mm, dreaming about something we do have a standard and here also in assessing a grammar we also do have a standard in terms of those instructors or teachers what are the standards that we find in a teacher or what is the standard after what is the standard or our expectation after we teach the specific topic so another also meaning of standard is is that it does serve as point of reference and a way of ensuring consistency when needed both in school and in life so we need to know where are we going that's the standard here what are we teaching in order to get to know to get there the curriculum so here basically the curriculum is our guide and it helps teachers to align and guide to the topic that we're teaching so, so standard in assessing a grammar in school context the standard are generally defined as benchmark for accountability or goals that student or teacher will going to attain so it's so for me it says it says there that standard call for consistency in what is expected from both students and teachers and tests and other measure measurements are developed to determine if the standard is being met so standard are our way to provide a stability and a consistency so we will go into this class a several type of types of standard so here we will going to define three types that are specific to teachers to teacher education so, so the types are the content standard with the with the geological standard and the performance standard so First, we will going to discuss what is the content standard. 
So the content standard, this is the knowledge of the teacher's candidate's knowledge of the content they plan to reach and their ability to explain important principles and concepts are delineated in professional standard. So content standard basically this is aligned to the lesson plans or as or in the cap capabilities of teachers itself. So it says here that there are two types of content standard. The one is the number one is declarative knowledge which consists of what candidates know or knowledge of concept and fact. So basically here what are the learning again or the capabilities of the teacher how advanced the teacher in terms of teaching a subject or a grammar so the second one is the procedural knowledge so here is what the candidate know how to do or what are the strategies of teacher should possess in terms of teaching a grammar so here, pedagogical standard. So pedagogical, it re it refers to interaction between teachers and students and the learning environment and the learning task. Here, how to teach or how students will going to learn? What are the strategies in order for students to learn? A grammar so what is taught in the in the curriculum so teacher should again follow the conceptual knowledge and the strategic process the third one is effective teaching strategies to import and specialize knowledge of subject area so here you need to have planning, instruction, analysis, and edu and basically education. You should be um, knowledgeable on your topic. You're not just teaching without a purpose. Okay. So the fourth one is student diversity and on the firing approaches to learning. So here we all know that classroom is one of the diverse places that that we can have so you will going to meet students that really love to ask questions love to ask um direction even that 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 direction is indicated in papers so you should be ready on hand kind of and the fifth one is how culture influence teaching and learning. So here, what are again what are what are the different approaches that we might um, that we might possess to in order for um, for the topic or the discussion to become uh, to become an active or interactive okay the fifth how cool so six is what teachers need to know about student preconception that must be engaged for effective learning so in order for this um for for the discussion to become um interactive we should um open or let student ideas to shy we need to become open for um, different ideas of students so seventh is teacher familiarity with standard based instruction assessment and learning so here these are the the system of instruction here you, you should learn how to assess how how we can create um, assessment or test and also how we are we should also familiar familiarize 
how to create grades or um, criteria in terms of learning a student. What are criteria in assessing a student? The next is performance standard. So here, performance, we're really going to base. We will going to see if we met the we met the standard of teaching. It is aligned to the performance standard. So first is. If we met the standard, so this is your depends on your um, lesson plan. So the second one is the criteria and evidence document that standard has been met. So here is the criteria guide that we should follow. Third is standard demonstrate the level performance expected to determine the progress and this one it we include here the scoring rubric what are the rubrics in terms of activities that you should possess in role playing drama or broadcasting or etc so standard include ex ex Templars of learner work to help teachers align instruct instructions. So here, if we follow our instructions back, we do. Um, if we do met what what indicate to our lesson plan. So that's that. So instruction and assessment are the appropriate level of difficulty. And the second one is standard led to assessment aligned to content standard. So here is is um, our declarative knowledge about our precision procedural knowledge met here. If our um, strategies are effective as a teacher, so yeah. So basically, that's all. That's this also um, very awesome. self-explanatory. Yeah, hope you guys um, learn for my discussion, and thank you for listening. Thank you and goodbye.